Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, we have a new employee that I want to introduce you to. Natalie, Lauren, can you stand up real quick? <laughs> so this is Natalie Warren. She just started at Earl. She's working in the records room, helping us kind of organize everything. Um, has She just came back from a fellowship in uh, Western Massachusetts, working with a museum, and has some ex uh, experience with other collections, uh, Shaker Village and, and all of that. So um, definitely say hi to her and, and give her a warm welcome. Um, she's great. So anyway, everybody's great. Uh, um, anyway. So uh, today it's gonna be me, Doug and Cheyenne talking to you all about what the um, Digital Data Working Group and our um, people have kind of been working on. Uh, so yeah, and it starts with me. So first we talk about FAIR a lot. I'm gonna do it again, cause again, we have a lot of new people. Um, so FAIR principles, uh, they, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. I'll try. Um, no, you're at, you're fine. Um, yeah. So fair principles. Uh, there is a great paper for you guys to read. If you're interested, it came out, um, 2016 in the scientific data journal, basically addressing the need, uh, addressing a, a recognition that more data means more problems. Um, and we needed a way, a structured standard of how to process your data, uh, for, machine learning or machine use and um, people reuse, uh, machine reading, sorry y'all. Um, so there's kind of that. Again, there's the paper resource. You can come talk to us for more specifics, but findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It's what all of us uh, in the in the data world are trying to do. And a lot of my projects are about getting this um, KGS data under these principles. Um, and then again, we've probably shown this to you before, it's in a lot of our presentations, but the data value chain, just basically showing that um, a lot of the perceived value of data is in the use part of, of the value chain. And so we wanna make sure our stuff is accessible and usable. That helps with uh, building legacy and reputation. So that's really important. Um, so, the principles of that are kind of brought together in what you call a data management plan to help everybody with data management plans. Uh, we developed some aids, but first off, um, so if you're going out for a proposal, a lot of, for a great proposal, a lot of our funding agencies are requesting a some form of a data management plan, but the instructions they give you can vary uh, pretty greatly. And so we try, we're trying to help Kind of get you through that because if you don't understand a data management plan you're not going to get very far on a on a proposal it's not going to be as strong as it could be um looking like you know what's going on so basically this part i'm just going to show you where these things are um so i'm going to escape that we put our stuff on teams it's the my kgs uh team everybody all of our staff should have access to this. And then we created a KGS data resources channel. Um, what I'm talking about today is in this data management plant development aids. And no, that's not what I want. Okay, so the first thing to kind of start with is uh, what we call the data management prompts. These are basically breaking down the different steps of a said project. Um, what data is involved in that project? Where are you getting it from? What kind of data, what software is needed to process that? What are the data products um, that are gonna come out and how are you gonna store them, share them, all of that. So it's just a, a quick list to kind of get you thinking through that entire process. Um, again, I'm not gonna go one by one, but like, you know, ethics, legal compliance, that's something people don't always think about. Um, and we have some good links for us dealing with like sensitive data um, and what 
KGS has come up with with policies and some other resources. Um, so that's where we recommend you start as you're kind of working that through that process using the um, template, project grant template. This gives you, what we tried to do is give you, again, more research resources from UK and other things that we've developed and um, externally. So again, fair data principles. Um, and kind of giving you a structure for your data management plan with more focused information about how KGS data is handled. Uh, so kind of something that you can copy and paste a lot of this information into your data management plan for your project with key items of like, we don't know what data you're creating, so you need to make sure that this part you get more specific. Um, what standards are we using? How, how are our data um, accessed and shared um, and archived? And then we also, so that was kind of the brevity portion, but then we also came up with this internal, which is a little more in depth. It gets a little more specific about these points. And so if you need more specific details, um, that's also here. Again, it's a good starting point for copy paste into your data management plan. But then if you also posing more questions and then you can um, talk to us more one-on-one -on -one about anything specific. So those are the three things. The other thing that we did, and I don't know if people have noticed, and this is just a little screenshot, but on our website, we have a like official KGS data management policy. Again, you can link to that in your plan, in your grant proposal. Um, so if you have like a space constraint or something, that's kind of helpful. And that you just go to our website, it's under about. Uh, so with that, oh yeah, okay. Oh, sorry y'all. Okay, so the other thing kind of wanted to talk about for a second, um, I don't know if anybody is using these resources to find data for your different projects, but I wanted to make sure you know they exist. This presentation will be available um, on that in that data resources channel. All of our presentations are there, and I have links to all of this stuff. But data one and re3data.org, those are repositories of repositories. Basically, um, you go there, you say what kind of data you're looking for, and it gives you links to all these different repositories from all over the world. Um, super useful. I think data one actually has a map so you can, it's a map and then it gives you like a grid system with the numbers and you kind of just keep zoning into how many data sets are available. Um, and then there's Cesar, which is focused on physical samples. So that's what I work with a lot. Um, we're working on getting all of our physical samples in, with uh, registered with IGSNs with Cesar. Um, and then we're talking to people at EarthChem about some of our more raw data going into EarthChem. Um, and then contributing to data. So like I said, we contribute to Cesar to, and we're talking about EarthChem. Um, we also contribute to UK Knowledge through our publications and our um, project data. Um, there's also a ton of repositories that we contribute to with USGS um, through state map through uh, data management, or sorry, uh, data preservation, all these other things. And then there's also a lot of uh, soil repositories that I've been finding that we might be able to start putting our stuff into as well. So, um, but always looking for new repositories for us to be a part of. So if you guys have suggestions or have questions about um, what, where you should be sending your data, um, I know that's kind of come up, especially like NSF, there's an approved list of repositories or like there's a standard um, trust core trust is is one of the standards and so we can help you find an appropriate repository um, if you need it so with that uh, data management plans are not just for grants and that's Doug's problem yeah <laughs> that's me um yeah so the reality is, is that we need to manage our data, you know, at KGS and um, and try to follow good data management um, practices and uh, infrastructure and and that sort of thing. So this should be a little bit of review for most people. Um, this sort of this architecture of 
what our data um, management looks like for most of KGS data um, internally. Um, so this isn't about the, you know, all these repositories that Liz was talking about. This is about the project data that you're working on or have worked on. Um, and then also the data that you need for those projects. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the request form here in a second, but um, really this is driven by a request form that you would fill out, that you fill out for creating a new project. And really any project, um, whether it's internally funded, externally funded, um, you're just thinking, oh, I may have a project, um, should go through that, that request form, which I'll show in a second. But, um, but really the, the data for projects reside in what we call you know, the active projects folder or active projects um, uh, share, uh, which is currently located on Lithos 2. This architecture could change, but the idea, um, the this idea of, of all these kind of shared locations that everybody can read, unless it's um, unless it's proprietary data that um, you know you're not allowed to share. Um, the idea is that everybody can see everybody else's active projects um, in your folders or uh, spaces. Um, and so right now we share them in folders. Um, I think most people are very familiar with this, this structure. Um, and then when that project uh, is done, the idea is that it moves to archive. This is an area that we are working on um, to make better, which I sent an email about, and I'll talk about that more in a sec. Um, but the archive is read only, so nobody really can edit data that's in the archive. If you need data from the archive to a current active project, um, you would pull it out of the archive um, and then into the active project area. Um, you know, if it's a lot of data, we can help with that. Uh, you know, me or Finn or Mike um, can come up with tools to migrate data, but, you know, just copying over uh, works. Um, in the, I put this here in the future, you know, like I said, you know, right now this stuff mostly resides on Lithos 2, but the architecture could change in the future. We could be using cloud infrastructure like um, Microsoft's Azure, um, if you're familiar with that. Um, that would probably be mostly for archive. I don't foresee us moving to Azure right off the bat um, for active because it's it's pretty expensive um, and we have a pretty good server infrastructure here at KGS. Um, so yeah, like all of this stuff is hosted uh, fairly locally, either you know, most in this building, um, but it's backed up. Um, and this is part of what you would write in a data management plan, you know, that there, there would be questions about, you know, data longevity and how long it can reside and, and things like that. Um, we have a very, a very robust backup, which became a lot more robust uh, recently, um, where we're utilizing uh, UK tape storage. So we're actually writing, um, the active and archive data to, and actually I think also the library, um, to UK uh, tape storage. Um, and that's now, a, it took a long time to copy that stuff over initially, and then it just detects changes. Um, and I can't remember the, how long that resides off the top of my head, but it's very, it's very robust. Um, and then we use Azure cloud storage. Um, this is very, this is called glacial storage or uh, I, I don't think that's the term actually, but it's um, it's for things like the scanned oil and gas documents, um, the core photos. Uh, we store um, a backup of that of those images in Azure um, in what are called blobs. Uh, that's not that important, but it is backed up in um, in the cloud. Um, so just a few of the things, and then this library, um, it could use some work, but, but the idea is that um, this is where we would put things like um, known shared data sets and GIS data is probably the big one that most people um, need. Uh, so uh, things like the 24K geologic map um, are on there. And you know one of my intentions is to write or have some sort of catalog for um, explaining what's in there. I've tried to write readmes and say the GIS data folder, but I encourage people to poke around in there and, and look and see what's in there. And um, if you have something to contribute, 
uh, we can add that certainly. These are these are data sets that are um, you know sort of like the 24K geologic data. Um, you know that's probably not going to be edited that much. Um, maybe hopefully, uh, but or could be. But anyway, um, they're they're uh, set in stone sort of data sets for the time being. <laughs> um, things like index map GIS data is in here too, and I try to update that every six months from the Kentucky Division of, um, of GIS. Um, we also have LIDAR data, which is located on the KGS field serve. And then of course the KGS databases, which currently reside in um, our SQL server. So just sort of a landscape, but, but the takeaway here is that all project data should live on one of these servers. Um, if you're on an active project here, but they should not be living at, uh, project data should never live on your on your hard drive on your local hard drive where that could crash you could lose information uh, being on these servers makes them you know if a, a hard drive on the server crashes it's okay because it's got it's got um, failover and backup um the I just wanted to talk just briefly about this non kgs project data storage because it is important um and it is robust like if you use um, the UK OneDrive, you get five terabytes of data and one K uh, UK OneDrive. The problem there is that that data is not available to anybody else at KGS. So these are this is an area you'd want to store, um, say your personal you know personnel documents or things that you didn't want other people to read, um, that sort of thing. It, when you leave the university, it does go away. So it's not. It doesn't reside forever, um, but it is a secure cloud storage um, OneDrive. We don't really use Google Drive that much anymore. Remember, if you remember, we had to migrate over to OneDrive. Um, so Google Drive kind of went away for UK employees. Um, it's still there, but I wouldn't use it. Um, and then we have Teams, you know, where we do things like store the data management documents and and uh, policies and put forms and. Um, hopefully everybody's really familiar with Teams, but that's also a cloud storage. It's stored in SharePoint, and it's a wonderful place to share um, share data. And, and actually, um, a lot of people have been creating Teams for projects. But I just want to reiterate that your ultimately your project data should end up in the active in that active folder so that others have access to it. Um, but I there's a huge value in using teams for collaboration. So I very much encourage that, but um, yeah, so that's that. Um, so just, yes, yeah. Just to finish that, too, if you go to the five terabytes of storage, every single team you get is five terabytes of storage. So all you have to do is create a team with just yourself in it, and you have another five terabytes. And another, yes. And another five terabytes. <laughs> yeah, no, I've done that. Not because I use five terabytes, but it, yes, yeah, no, it's, yeah. I have my own team. It's kind of nice. Um, team Doug. It's team old lady with the phone. <laughs> Going to be my new icon. Um, so I sent an email about this, but just I'm going to go quickly through this. I swear. Um, uh, but we do have a new project form. It's in Teams, uh, my KGS, and then under KGS projects. Uh, you can get to it from the top here, form, request a new project. Um, you can actually uh, save that bookmark if you don't want to go through Teams because it's just, it's an ARC, um, it's a Esri form. Um, and it's new. Um, it looks, some of the stuff looks very familiar from the previous form, but it collects a lot more information um, about uh, your project, what resources you're going to use. Are you going to use the URL? Are you going to use IT? web development? Are you going to use the lab? Um, and then uh, also, uh, because I can use Esri stuff, um, it asks you to draw a um, geographic extent of your uh, project area. And actually, you can draw more than one. Um, and I'll show just real briefly that you can view that information. So collecting a lot more metadata about your projects that I think will be useful for you know, finding, for um, uh, for also, uh, we can make reports about where projects are located, um, things like that. So I'm, I'm very excited about this form. 
On the back end, it does a lot of cool stuff um, because when it's submitted, you now get an email with all the information you filled out. Um, if you say, say, oh, I want to use the URL, I'm going to, I anticipate using the URL for this project. It kicks off an email to the URL staff so they know a project is possibly going to be using um, the URL. Um, and then uh, for IT and, and also the lab, um, it creates an event. Um, it creates an event, you know, you put in when that when that project is supposed to end, and it creates an event 30 days before the project ends and then reminds you, hey, this stuff, this project's about to end, you need to either move this stuff to archive or arrange for an extension. Um, and also there's a calendar that's created a calendar event about when the project was created and when it ended. And so it's a lot more robust than the previous form. And um, so I've only had two people use it. So it it was stood up the beginning of July and I only had two people use it. So hopefully, maybe that just means everybody's working hard on the projects and don't have new projects yet. But um, so you can also access uh, viewing the project data at the top here view. Um, you can also save this URL if you just wanna keep refreshing and seeing how many projects are being created, but um, you see the two that have been created. It also has, you, I don't know if you can read that very well, but the tabs here are the um, previous, from the previous form. I didn't want to create a bunch of geographic, I couldn't, don't have the time to go through and figure out what the geographic area was for every single project that was previously created. So I created one point <laughs> here at MMRB. Um, I don't know we can that's something we could work on in the future but um, going forward people can um, y'all can put in your uh, geographic area extent of your projects which I think will be useful it could be all of Kentucky um, but uh, if you have specific areas in Kentucky you can kind of draw a rough outline it's not I'm not asking you to digitize you know a quad or something it's just sort of getting an idea um and then I've sent an email about this, but if you can please help us review the current slate of active projects, because there are a lot. Um, we haven't done a very good job of moving things to archive. Um, this includes me a lot. Um, and so I've created a spreadsheet um, and I've sent an email about this for people to go through and look for their project folders that they're active on. Tell me if you still want them to remain active. If not, they're moving to archive um, after August 30th at some point. Um, we'll need to go through this. You can also put notes. So some people have asked, oh, can I suggest a name change? Not for everything. Please don't want to change every project folder, but this is a good time to review all this stuff. Um, so, uh, and then review who should have right access um, to that folder and um, that sort of thing. So. If you could please do that, I'll probably send out another reminder email. Um, so, yeah, that's <laughs> my part. So, hi, I'm Cheyenne. I think almost everybody in this room uh, knows me, so I don't need to tell you too much uh, about myself. But I'm the uh, current wrangler of print and digital publications. My goals at this job are to distill order from chaos, no guarantees assist the public with info and map requests, answering the phone, speaking to little old ladies who don't know what kind of thing is seeping up into their yard, uh, supporting KGS with plotting, scanning mail, other like office services, and then acting as a liaison to UKY libraries and the institutional repository, which is called UK Knowledge. And that's kind of what I'm mostly gonna talk about today. Uh, that is Doug. Okay, so. <laughs> UK Knowledge, if you haven't seen this before, this is the uh, landing page for, and you can see I made it a minute ago, um, but the Kentucky Geological Survey has its own page in UK Knowledge. It is the institutional repository. And so we can add anything that's published that is publicly available to this site. This is a great backup in addition to the many layers of backups and storage that we have. The great thing about this too is that it gives us really nice metrics and it's accessible and it's a place where people look for information. Uh, so when you make a data set, a data set is born, it's so beautiful. You've completed it. 
you need to submit it to me and then we're going to publish it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how those phases work. So the researchers, writers, and reviewers are the people that are involved in the completion of a data set. I don't really have much to do with that, but I should know that it is happening. <laughs> Let me know when you're reaching that point of the data life cycle. Um, and then I will come in and talk to you uh, whoever sort of the, is the PI or whoever's going to be submitting them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll take care of the publication portion. So when you complete it, that means that you have your final draft, everything's correct, everything's been checked. You have your abstract written up. Um, that can be as long or as short as you want it to be. Uh, but the longer or like the more keywords, the better. Um, you need a data dictionary, which is just explaining, I mean, if you've made data sets, you know what this is. It's just something that kind of helps people understand how to use it. And then a README. Um, when you are going to submit a data set to me to be sort of ferried towards UK knowledge, you want to fill out this submission form. It's in Teams. I can hook you up with the link if you don't have it. Uh, the link is down here on this presentation. Um, but you can also just ask me, just Teams me or email me and I can send you the link, no problem. I think at this point, Ben is the only person who's used it. Uh, do, how is your experience using it, Ben? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, I ask for um, keywords and I have a bunch of drop downs that have like generic keywords you can choose from. So you're not put on the spot to like generate a bunch of your own keywords. They're more standardized. Um, as you're submitting it, you have to do the form. Then we also need to know any kind of like methodology, funding information, stuff that you would have already hopefully on hand. Um, and then one thing that I really want to start asking people for is cover art. If you have a cover page or a photograph or something that is more visually interesting than the pre-generated cover page of a document, that's awesome. If you don't have that, it's okay. It just makes things look nicer and is like more appealing to users. Um, and this is something that UK libraries ask me to, to drop for you all. Also, ORCID IDs. I've pestered each and every one of you in this room about your ORCID ID, and almost everybody has submitted one. If you have one and you're a researcher and you haven't given it to me, please send me an email uh, and I can walk you through it. It's really easy. I'm picking on Matt because he's made his. Um, but it's just this website, ORCID.org. And you just log in, make an account, and then it'll generate a 16-digit number for you. The 16-digit number is a, it's supposed to be a thing that follows your work around the internet and helps people sort of like digitize, centralize, and access your materials. Ideally, you shouldn't have to update this page. This should update. This should crawl the web and update for you. Uh, that doesn't always happen, but that is the idea. OK, last phase. Now we're going to transfer the files. You put them in a share for me to access. Um, I generate the DOI. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. The DOI is the digital object identifier. This has caused a lot of confusion. I'm going to try to clear it up. Uh, and then I stick it into UK knowledge and we'll version the data if necessary. If we need to upgrade or change anything, um, we'll, we'll take care of that. So the DOI is a foundation um, and it's the it's this group that uh, basically manages this giant listing of digital objects. They all get, again, like a, a random ID number. Uh, in this case, they're, they're parsable. You can tell that this is a data set that was published in 2022. Um, they're not always parsable by people. Um, and they're always unique. So in order to get a DOI, I have to have all the metadata necessary to make a UK knowledge post. Um, and that's all represented by fields in that form that you'll fill out for me. Okay, quick note about versioning your data. Please use numbers. Please do not use final updated new, I mean at this time, .csv. I'm not gonna know what that is. It's really, really tough. And if anything has been updated or um, reversioned, add another number. One or two for the second version. Maybe it's uh, a string that is the date. Maybe it's something else that makes sense to you. Cool. Let me know. Just just be sure to tell me what it is. And I've gotten files, and I may I make files all the time. 
that are final updated for real this time dot whatever. So just please try because <laughs> it'll help me make sure that I have the correct data going onto the website and that I won't have to like re-upload things and cause confusion and have people downloading the wrong documents. Um, that is about it. Anybody got questions? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we're your like digital Sherpas. Yeah, yeah. Um, for all of you, I guess. Uh, there's like a barrier to entry for a request in the project. Is, is it possible to have like a proposals folder so the request we go through a process and then get like a little um, a folder generated in a proposals folder where we fill out the information and see where it takes us and maybe those documents we have about the uh, data repositories are automatically in those folders for us so it's where we can generate proposal ideas but if it doesn't go anywhere you can just delete it you don't have to worry about it but that'll get us started and then if it does go somewhere we can have it transferred to the active drive like to the main session yeah what we've sense. done in the past is create a project folder that's is like proposal ideas about like earth mri has a proposal project uh project folder I've done one when I was about to write one, but I totally see what you're saying. Um, and that, to me, that sounds more like a team. That'd be better as a okay. team. But yeah. I don't know, Doug, what do you think? Yeah, I was thinking team as well. I mean, when we originally came up with this whole thing with the form, the idea was if you had a, even a proposal idea, you would just say, what's that you would create? You go through the process of creating it. Um, but that being said, there are a bunch of folders, not a bunch, but a few folders in there that they haven't gone anywhere and now we got to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So in that in that case, yeah, I mean, if you're I think I think a team is appropriate. We don't all need to see this and um just got all your your people uh, that you want on the thing. And yeah, if it turns into a project. However, um I will say if if you're going to actually uh, you know, apply for that proposal, mm -hmm. I would go ahead and create, a, go through the active project folder process because that's where maybe gross budgets and things like that. So yeah. And we can rope in for that RE AGS for those? Uh, you can rope in anybody that's AUK um, to have kind of read access to that. Um, but not at that If they're out. So, so yeah. One of the questions, yeah, so that is a challenge because we have this like infrastructure that we have to live right. with AD and all that stuff and, yeah. and whatnot. And that's what I was saying with um, using teams because you could create a team for that project even after the proposal period and you can use that to collaborate. But really, you know, the, the KGS related data, the things that KGS people work on need to live in that active. Or at some point, <laughs> hopefully, during the active project. So, anyway, uh, 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 how they cover the project? Do they then enter departmental grants, get done, what they did? Um, the Alex from the Flower did and she just said it again. We're not flexible. I just don't put anything on the seat, but oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. I just think it's very important to note that this is the org ID, the data stewardship ideas, data management plans. These aren't just a whim or a trend or an ideology here at KGS. It is part of the whole research ecosystem right now. And participating in those, engaging with those, is going to make your data more discoverable. It's going to make it's going to raise your academic profile, making the data findable has always been what makes KGS a reputation. Our data and our publications yeah. is the foundation of our long-term reputation. So getting this right, findable, accessible, this is huge. This is, this is not, oh, I'm too busy for this. No, we're not. We all have to do this. This is part of the business. So, yeah, big deal. Thank you. And just speaking, like, 
to to that point, we have a really small percentage of KGS publications, maps, and other materials on the repository right now. But our use metrics are decent. Like people look there for materials and they do download stuff. We have download reports for things, and I get a little digital dashboard report every month. Um, so it's a really, really nice way to track usage of your work by, you know, pu the public or other researchers who, you know, it tells you where on earth they came from, uh, where they accessed from. So if they're using a VPN, no guarantees, but uh, a lot of people are using our materials in other um, parts of the world that have system geology. Here. Oh. Is the intention to, um, I know I've asked this before, but I'm not in the same uh, work that I used to be. <laughs> is the intention to get everything, all of KGS's publications that have any kind of digital into the UK knowledge? Yes. And then just shut down a lot? Not, not saying shut down. Or just archive it, I guess. Yeah, so archiving, we have to maintain our own internal archive. UK Knowledge is not our archive. UK Knowledge is an access point. And so getting it... Oh, so it's almost like a marker pointing to the OLAP entry? No, no, no. Uh, we have to upload our material to UK Knowledge. They do store a copy in their repository, right? And we're trying to direct people to the UK Knowledge copy. All I'm saying is we have to keep... We have to maintain our ownership of our versions as a digital archive and a physical archive separate from what is being uploaded, the copy that's going up to UK Knowledge. But we are shift, we're trying to push people to UK Knowledge. It's just, we have found in a lot of ways, um, our current search, our geo search is a lot more user-friendly than UK Knowledge and a lot of these other repositories like USGS that have our material. And so that's the important part of our website and our queries is being is its user friendliness. But we're pushing in there because UK knowledge is a bigger access point and they get they get uh, better metrics and everything. Yeah, well, yeah. I was more um, like, a, or do we have a goal, I guess, of when everything will be in UK knowledge and not only in OLAPS? Oh, it's a work in progress. It's going to take a couple of years. 2023. Baby, my goal. We are twenty twenty three here for real. This year, twenty thirty. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, what? It's the year that I want all the stuff in. It's the year that I want all the stuff in the catalog. Uh, I would love to have cataloged everything by the end of this year, but digitized and up in UK knowledge or up in another place where people can download it in a few years. Yeah, I mean twenty thirty is like. So I'm right below the air. But yes, yeah. no, 2023 is when I want to have everything cataloged and searchable, mm -hmm. uh, but not necessarily digitized and accessible. But yeah. we, yeah, uh, Cheyenne's been working through a lot of our early stuff. There's yeah. so much material that we have that is not digitized, it's not accessible in any way. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, um, yeah. It, which is, we're finding a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> so, and so Right. Uh, Rachel, I'm meeting with an archivist today. Uh, I just wanted to do a plug for like the publication thing that I was having too. So one of the cool things about UK Knowledge and one of the amazing things about having Cheyenne here is when we're going through the publication process, the, there's a home for data. Like there used to be a really kind of, it used to be very difficult um, but it's like an addendum to link to your data. I'm pretty sure like, most journals are allowing you to put Excel spreadsheets and things like that up there. But in the next year, there's going to be a huge push on my end too. If you have a KGS publication and you have associated data, um, publishing that data and we can link the two online so people who are finding your data will also go look at your publication. People who are looking at your publications will also go reference your data. Mm -hmm. It's win-win. So. Yeah. And yeah, there's now we a have... lot more like format stuff we can do, stuff we couldn't put online with our publication through OLAPS or our software, UK uh, knowledge can handle all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is something we've been trying to do, and the working group has developed, you know, workflows for that, but we haven't, before having Cheyenne, like, we didn't have anybody to really help people through that process. It was kind of like, here's documentation, come talk to us, but you're kind of on your own a little bit. Um, but now having Cheyenne, now we have like a set system to help everybody get everything in there. So 
Yeah. Thank you. Think of me as a fence. You take your illicitly gathered data and you want to make it valuable. I can push it onto the internet to a place where other people will. Yeah, right. Data bonder. Yeah, I can tell you data bonder. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. any other questions? Thing. Yes. So you mentioned fair. Yes. A couple of times. So are our databases this up on the internet? So KGS no, and KGS can't be, and that that is below NSF. Like when I talked to you about this last year whenever it was right. it's too siloed that's the that's why it's so important for us data to be pushed out into these larger repositories that are interconnected yeah so and are considered approved by like nsf for some so. purposes uk knowledge isn't even right no you can't universities no yeah. Are yeah not allowed so probably yeah. but like the the places that i showed you guys today they are right so Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, thank this you. will, yeah, thank you. And I'll put this up on my QGS. If anybody has any questions, please reach out. So, thanks for stopping. I need to stop.